I was listening to Greg making some opening comments, <clears throat> and he talked about being blessed. I can't tell you how much I've been blessed. Just talking about my best friend Jesus, sharing directly from his living word from night to night, it's, it's just overwhelming for me sometimes. I, I, just, I know that as we hear his word spoken to us, it's, it's the Holy Spirit that's speaking to you through God's holy word. And that's what changes lives. Myself or anyone up here that would be presenting is nothing more than a vessel used by God to be a spokesman for him. And that's what I pray every day. Lord, give me the words to speak. May I be someone that would present you in such a light that it would glorify your name. So I just praise God from night to night that we can come together. As I tell you every night, we have a fantastic <clears throat> subject tonight that we're covering. Revelations, thousand years. The scripture talks about an awakening. But when we force every night, we talk about if it's in the Bible, what do you do? I believe it. If it disagrees with the Bible, it's not for me. So friends, we will be living in this time. But in the future, we're going to be living in the time of eternity. You can't even compare the two. Today we have watches, we have calendars, we have things that we follow that charts time. But in eternity, to me, time is irrelevant. Can you imagine one day waking up and someone comes up to you and says, Mike, how old are you? Well, I'm 1.2 billion years old. I mean, it. In mortality, we talk about it every night. God is going to give us a perfect body that lives forever without any heartache. And I, I look forward to that day. So in John 5, 28 and 29, do not marvel at this. For the hour is coming which all who are in the graves will hear the voice and come forth. Those who have done what? Good to the resurrection of life. And those who have done what? Evil to the resurrection of condemnation. So how many resurrections does this Bible passage describe? The resurrection of life and the resurrection of damnation. So tune in closely tonight. Some of you, this might be a first time hearing this. But friends, it's in the Bible. It's very clear when you tie this together together with all the other things that we have studied, it makes full sense. So that's why you're here from night to night. And praise God you're not missing a night. God bless you all. So we go on and we, we think of this. So the first resurrection is the resurrection of life. Jesus comes and he receives his people onto him. The graves are open. Those that are sleeping in the tomb, they awake. And friends, they awake to an eternal kingdom a beautiful eternal life with our lord and jesus and friends you think about this the wake to see the glory of god to see his face to see him live right in front of us it's hard to put into words in first thessalonians chapter 4 verse 16 it says for the lord himself shall descend from heaven with a what a shout with the voice of an archangel and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. So friends, when you go to sleep on this side, and you're in the grave for X number of years, the next waking moment, you will see Jesus coming. What a thing to wake up to. Amazing. There's mornings I wake up to, and I know I have a conference call, and I know I have to do this today. But to wake up and to know Jesus is coming for us and that we're saved, what a place to be in in life, isn't it? So friends, death is nothing, nothing to be feared. Our lives are hidden in Christ. If we have the confidence that we have given our hearts fully to Jesus, then our life is hidden, hidden in our Savior. So the Bible continues with this. Let's continue to read. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17, it says, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds 
to meet the Lord in the air. That will be a glorious resurrection morning, friends. So shall we ever be with the Lord. What's the word? Ever be. Ever be with the Lord. You know what? As I read this, I thought about it today. We can be ever with the Lord this moment. Every moment. Every breathing moment of our life, we can be directly connected with our Lord. And that's the relationship I believe that every one of us here today, we're pursuing that kind of relationship with our Savior. Ever with the Lord. So friends, when Jesus comes, there's only, there's two classes. There's, what are the two classes? The saved and the... So the first resurrection... Those lost, they're destroyed by his brightness. And you know what? Here's the thing that I'm concerned with. Many books, many popular speakers talk about this second chance. We don't see it in the Bible when you study it from Genesis to Revelations. We are talking about a second coming of Christ. And friends, there's no second chance. We need to make our decision today. Can you say amen? Make our decisions today. There is no reason why I should say I'm going to wait for 10 years before I love my wife Jesus or my love my wife Debbie. Think about that. Wouldn't that be terrible to say, you know, 10 years from now, Debbie, I'll start loving you. You'll give me a second chance. How does that work? How does that make you feel? Think of Jesus in heaven. You're saying, I'm going to wait, and I'll get around to it someday. I've had many people tell me this. You know, that's Russian roulette. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. Just like that accident that took place down the road just a, an hour ago. That could have been someone's life. We don't know. I want to be right with Jesus today. There's no time to wait. No time to mess around but to be right with Jesus today. So let's go on and see what the Bible also has to say. Revelation chapter 20 verse 6. Blessed and holy is he who has part in what? The first resurrection. Okay, we're setting this up now. So there's two groups, the saved. The first group is resurrected to live with Christ forever. So the living righteous friends are changed and they ascend in the sky with the glorious immortal bodies to live with Christ for eternity. Then there's another group as well as Revelation describes this group. There's two groups. The second group, as we already identified, is that group that is lost. They're not joyful. They weren't joyful anticipating the second coming of God. So let's bring it back to our everyday lives. Do you wake up every morning anticipating Jesus Christ's return? Every morning you get up, you can look up and say, Lord, I am so glad that I'm a part of the family of God and I'm anticipating your coming soon. I know the skeptics for years would say, you know, Christians have been claiming his second coming for years, decades, centuries. Where is he? Well, friends, if you have a full, committed relationship with Jesus Christ today, he is here. He's living within you. You are his living sanctuary. He wants to dwell among you and he wants to dwell within you. That's the start of your lifelong relationship with him. He will return. We have faith. That's our hope as Christians, that he will return. Revelation 6, 15 through 17 says, And then the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? So think about it, friends. The first class looks up and says, This is my Lord that I've long waited for it. They're excited about Jesus' coming. Can you get excited? Think of the most exciting thing that ever happened in your life. And times at times 
a number that I can't even tell you. That's how excited you're going to be when Jesus returns. But there's a second class, and their hearts are filled with fear, with tragedy. They feel an emptiness. They've turned their back on God. They didn't look at him when they lived on this earth as king of kings and lord of lords. That should be our daily prayer, our daily commitment. He is our king of kings and our lord of lords. So we've established there's two classes, right? There's the saved and then there's the lost. Jesus invites you to make him your lord, your savior, your king. No one, friends, and I emphasize this, no one needs to be in a position where they're unprepared. They're not prepared for Jesus' second coming. The second coming of Christ is the hope of all Christians, like you and I. That's our hope. That's our desire to see Jesus face to face someday. Events at Christ's coming. So, at the events of Christ's coming is believers are resurrected. That's one class. The believers receive immortality. The wicked living consumed, it tells us in the scriptures. The wicked dead remain in the grave, and they're not yet resurrected. Their resurrection of righteousness ones are the righteous that are resurrected first. And they're the ones we're going to talk about that spend that thousand years with Christ. And then the believers ascend to heaven with Christ. So what happens to Satan? Satan is destroyed. He's left on earth. And we'll get into more details as what is his role for the next thousand years as Christ's believers had ascended to heaven with him. So when, when does God make this earth new? What did Jesus mean when he said that he was going to create a new heaven and a new earth for us? That's found in 2 Peter verse 3. So when does this happen? We're going to explore this again in the book of what? Revelation. We've been in the book of Revelation a lot. We spent some time in Daniel, but we've used the whole Bible to establish the truth. So is anyone alive on earth during the thousand years? That's a great question. That's a question that I had. So we're going to answer, is there anyone alive during those thousand years so the book of revelation provides an answer in revelation 19 they find a description of christ coming as king of kings and lord of lords revelation chapter 20 verses 1 and 2 describes what happens next let's look then i saw an angel coming down from heaven having the key to what the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him here for what? So I didn't make that thousand years up, did I? It's found in God's word. A thousand years. The word millennium is not used in the Bible. It comes from two Latin words, milli and annium, meaning one thousand years, a millennium. So notice, the Bible says that Satan is cast into what? A bottomless pit. A bottomless pit. So what is a bottomless pit? Is it some subterrain that's somewhere in the inner parts of the earth? Let's look. Let's explore a little bit. These are things that we have learned growing up. I know traditionally I've learned some things about this whole scenario that's quite different. So the New Testament word is a buso which means bottomless. Bottomless pit is a buso. So, and that's the Greek language as you break it down. So we'll move on. So if you look at the meaning of abyss, how that word is used in the Bible, abyss simply means a place of darkness, a place of void. It remembers, if we go back to the book of Genesis, Genesis we can read what it says here. It says that the earth was without what? Form and void. The earth was without form and void, abyssal. The Bible term means that it describes the earth in darkness before it was created. 
a dismal place, no life, nothing. It was dark. This bottomless pit of Revelation 20 is not some deep subterranean in the middle of the earth. It's talking about something specifically. So when you think, when Christ comes that second time, friends, I love this picture. There's many art, artists that have did this rendition, but the colors and the beauty of this. The second time, the righteous dead are resurrected and the righteous living are caught up with the Lord to live with him for how long? Forever. Forever and ever and ever. So friends, when I think about this, <clears throat> when you think of Christ's second coming, the earth then at that point is made desolate. The wicked living at that time are destroyed. They are consumed by the glory of God. And then the dead and the unbelievers stay in their grave. And it's without form, and it was void. It was an abyss. So let's continue to look at Scripture here as we're moving forward. So desolate, destroyed planet Earth. It's that bottomless pit that we've talked about. What are these chains that bind Satan? Does God come down and put handcuffs on Satan? What kind of chains are they? The Bible tells us very clearly. Let's look at this. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for what? So during this thousand years, Satan and his angels are bound to this abyss, this darkness. No one to tempt. The earth lays desolate, friends. What a dismal thought to consider that. Here's another rendition of what it could potentially look like. So during a thousand years, Satan wanders the earth. When you think of his primary goal, what has Satan done for the past 6,000 years? He's tempted. He's brought destruction. He's brought heartache. But now he's here on this earth, and during that thousand years, why doesn't Jesus just make things new and then get it over with? Well, there's a reason for it, and I want you to really understand this because we'll go over it a few times because this is really the pivotal point of this whole study tonight. Everything God does is to ensure the security of the universe for eternity. Just think about that. It is forever that sin will be washed away. God desires, here it is, God desires that sin will never show its ugly head again. Amen. Can you say amen to that? Never again. In order for this to occur, friends, two things must happen. Let's look at those two things. Now, number one, God is love, and God is worthy, and God is to be trusted. Angels and humans on earth that God loves incredibly, that God was trusted his son to come here and die for us to show that he loves us, that he loves this world. He was willing to do that for us. What a great God that was to send his son to die on the cross in Calvary for us. So no sin, friend, is so dark, God's love cannot blot it out. I'll go back 39 years again, and for a long time, the devil kept telling me I was not worthy. There was no hope for you, Mike. The life that you chose when you were younger, that is your destiny. Just, just stay on the path, and that's your destiny. And I can continue to hear his voice. There's no hope for you to get victory over alcohol. There's no hope for you to get victory over drugs. There's no hope for you to live a life different outside of the one that you live. Friends, I'm telling you tonight that there's no sin so dark that God cannot forgive you. And I praise God for that. This great controversy, friends, is between good and evil. And you know what? This great controversy is going to be settled between Christ and Satan. 
Jesus is going to be vindicated throughout the entire universe because he's a loving God, he's a fair God, he's a transparent God, and he loves us with every fiber of his godly being, friends. That's how much God loves us. Is there anyone alive on earth during that thousand years? Satan and his angels, friends, are bound and chained to circumstances. The circumstances is the rebelliousness that they created in heaven and has sustained this sinful life for over 6,000 years. They're chained to this earth that is an abyss, that is void, no life, darkness, very depressed environment. I can only imagine what that could look like. So the Bible says this, Jeremiah 4, chapter 4, verses 23 through 27. I beheld the earth, and indeed it was without form and void, and the heavens they had no light. I beheld the mountains, and indeed they tremble, and all the hills moved back and forth. I beheld, and indeed there was no man, and all the birds of the heavens had fled. I beheld, and indeed the fruitful land was a wilderness. You know, it's obvious that the prophet is not describing creation here, friends. This is a time of a fruitful land because the wilderness and the desolation place is after when Jesus comes and receives his righteous to himself. This earth is without void. I beheld, and indeed, a fruitful land was a wilderness. For thus saith the Lord, the whole land shall be desolate, yet I will not make a full end. And at that day, the slain of the Lord shall be from one end of the earth even to the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented or gathered or buried. They shall become refuge on the ground. Love brings life, friends. Selfishness brings death. True? How do we love like Jesus? Some of the major battles in relationship is because of selfishness and pride. And I look at this little lovely one walking here. Yes, yeah, you, honey. I looked at my little granddaughter today. She's almost four months old, Deb. And I see how precious she is. And I said to, I don't know if you heard me, but I said, she was, we were all that size one day. Innocent, seeking love, desiring companionship, desiring protection, a sense of security. How do we lose that? You know how we lose it? Some of us have been fortunate to have parents that raised us. And they were the best parents that they could be. And they provided some of these characteristics of good nurturing for a child. Love, compassion, understanding. Sometimes, you know, discipline. All those things, but it builds a character in a person. When I think of Jesus and his perfect life on this earth, he was without sin. He was the perfect model for mankind. And when I looked at that little one walking down the aisle just a moment ago, Jesus says that we need to be like little children. We need to depend on him. Don't ever grow up to the point to where we become so selfish, so set in our ways. I know I have faults. Not only does my Lord pour them out, point them out, but some of my family sometimes will say, you know, Mike, you need to pray about that. And I do, and I do, and I pray that I will get to a point where my life will be one that's always in constant harmony with God. Isn't that your desire tonight? Praise God. Let's move on. So the Bible says this. In Revelations 20, verse 6, Blessed and holy is he who has part in what? The first resurrection over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. It says that the righteous, 
are priests of God and shall reign with him a thousand years. What are they doing while they're reigning with Christ? You ever wonder about that? The Bible is pretty clear about this. This is fascinating. This again defines the God that I serve. He holds nothing back. The curtain is totally open. He is transparent with his created beings. Not only is he transparent with us, but he's transparent with those two-thirds of the angels that are in heaven, and he's transparent with the whole universe. What the universe holds out there has got to be just phenomenal. I've never been one to be so myopic in my thinking that God only created us. I have to imagine because this universe is so vast, God has perfectly functioning planets out there. But he's going to show the world that he is so transparent and that he loves us so much that he's going to reveal everything. So let's watch what happens here. Revelations tells us, And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. And the books were open. You know, you say, I don't quite understand. What does that mean? Why, after the lost are lost, are the books open? Do you ever wonder that? I think it's a fair question, but I think there's a solution to that. There's a drama between good and evil, between Christ and Satan. And God wants us to see this drama very clearly. So during the millennium, God will answer what? Every question, we will have the opportunity to look over heaven's record books. Wow, really? We're going to see in the scripture. We will finally understand that God has done everything that he could to save you and I, or to save our parents or our friends. Anyone who has lost friends, listen to this, anyone that is lost, it's because of their choice. No one's going to be able to point the finger at God and say, you weren't fair. No, 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 not at all. The best way to show the truth is open the books, to reveal very plainly to mankind that we serve a God that not only loves us, but he trusts us because he wants us a part of this process. I think that's just phenomenal. That just shows me more and more how much Jesus and his Father and the Godhead loves us with an everlasting love. So the entire universe understands at the end of this <clears throat> that God has done everything that he could to save mankind. He pulls out all the stops at the end here to finally relinquish this thing that is called sin, to finally relinquish this thing that is called pride, to finally relinquish this thing that is called, like Satan said, I, I want to be in power. I want to be in charge. It's about that pride within us. When you think of the pride that seems to ruin many relationships because it's about us. But our goal, friends, it should be every day is that my life is about Jesus. And if I can please my God, then my attitude will be pleasing to those around me. So let's continue to look at this. Every question about his just, justice and love will be fully answered. I mean, this is an amazing thing that all loving God, this all wise God, just God, allows us to participate in the final judgment. Have you ever heard anything like that? I have because I've read it in the Bible. But it's true, the Bible says that. So let's see what the Apostle Paul says here. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2 and 3, do you know, here it goes again, Mike's not making this up, it's in the Bible, and if it's in the Bible, we do what? We believe it. Do you know that the saints will judge the world? And who are the saints? That's me and you, friends. The saints will judge the world. 1 Corinthians, we'll move on here, it says, do you not know that we shall judge angels? Think about that for a moment. I lost the slide here. Okay. So, <clears throat> when heaven's books are open, we'll fully understand, we'll be able to see God's wonderful plan. Let's review what happens during this thousand years real quickly. This period, this millennium. 
So events during the millennium. The righteous in heaven, the wicked remain dead here on earth. Satan and his angels are what? Bound, chained by circumstances to this earth. And the earth remains desolate. What events happen after the millennium? The wicked dead are resurrected. The events are foretold in Revelation chapter 20, verse 5. Let's read. But the rest of the dead did not live again until one. When? Till the end, when the thousand years were finished. The rest of the dead of this passage are the wicked dead, friends. So, two resurrections. There's the resurrection of life when Jesus comes and we're received onto him. At the end of the thousand years, we see that there's damnation. The wicked, it's the end of them. It's the final destruction. So John describes this group. In Revelation 20, verse 8, number is as the sands of the sea. Friends, Satan and his wicked angels and this gigantic, gigantic army attempts to attack the holy city which descends from heaven at the end of the thousand years. Listen to this. Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be what? Released from his prison. And will go out to what? Deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Friends, it's a climactic age. It's a time that the holy city comes down to this earth. There's a one battle left. And we're going to see what the Bible has to say about that. So then Satan is resurrected with his wicked angels. They rush the city. I can't tell you how many millions or billions of created people and fallen angels, they attempt to overthrow God's city. Friends, everyone, everyone will be either inside the city or outside the city walls. In the Bible, it tells us that those walls are transparent, that you can see outside those walls. And I've talked about this many times with loved ones, with friends and families, with Bible studies. Think about it, friends. You have two choices. You're inside the city in those transparent walls. Satan and his armies begin to attack the holy city that comes down. And then all of a sudden, you're standing there and you recognize your neighbor. You see your uncle. You see your brother. You see a child. No, it shouldn't be that way. Friends, God is building an army of Christians like you and I. He's building a people that will stand up for truth and warn the people what's coming upon this world. I don't want to see any of my loved ones lost. Friends, this is a real scenario. That city's coming down. And the sad thing is, we have to continue with the story, friends. Jesus will either be your Lord or not your Lord at all. Friends, He needs to be the throne of our hearts. We need to give Him our hearts. Listen to what the Apostle John says here. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and He will dwell with them, and they shall be His people. God Himself will be with them and be their God. Can you imagine being part of that family? That's just, that's overwhelming. To be on the winning team. To be on a team that you know that the leadership loves you to no end. Just loves you with all their heart. Friends, 
I want to be on this side of the wall. I want my families, my neighbors, my friends, my work, co-workers, anyone that I come in contact with, I want to warn them about what's coming upon this world. We see the city, the glorious city descends to the world. Satan marshals in a legions of his host. Now they attack the city, believing they, he still puts in their mind that they can win this war. Friends, he's the biggest liar, and we've stated that from the beginning of these series, that he lies to deceive because he wants you to be lost. And you know why? Because he's lost. And let's back up many, many thousands of years ago. Christ and the Godhead did everything they could to save Lucifer. They pleaded with him. They worked with him. But they did not force him. He made the choice. In the judgment hour, friends, when the books are open, it'll be your choice if you're not inside the gates. And my prayer tonight is that every one of you will be a part of that glorious kingdom that will last forever. I can't wait to someday we can walk a beach. Somewhere, who knows where. Maybe in the new earth or somewhere in the universe as we'll have the capability. Maybe I'm getting ahead of myself because there's a study on that one night. Let's save that for another night. I'm just getting excited here because what God is planning for us is so real. It is real, friends. So they went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The entire universe, friends, is clean. Satan and his evil angels are no more. Whew. That's hard. Amen, sister. It's hard, hard to even fathom that. But again, our Lord tells us that this will happen. He says, tarry a little while. Be confident. Have faith. Know that I'm here for you during these trials. And once again, and I say it every night, that we are a family going through a battle. We need to uplift each other, love each other, and encourage each other. So at the end of the day, Satan and his angels, friends, are devoured. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their what? According to their works. <clears throat> By the things which were written in the book. But before the wicked and the unsaved are fully destroyed forever, God allows them, listen to this, this is great love. God allows them to see a panoramic view. They too will understand that God is fully just and that every knee, the Bible says in Philippians chapter 2, every knee will bow before him. That's every knee will bow before him because he is a just God, a fair God. Just and righteous are thy ways, O God. <clears throat> the entire universe in perfect symphony perfect harmony just and righteous are thy ways one pulse that beats throughout the universe that's in perfect harmony everyone in perfect harmony no misunderstandings no judgment of others perfect love can it be is it true is there a world like that being prepared for us? I believe there is, friends, and I know you believe too tonight. <clears throat> now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth has passed away. Also there was no more sea. The fire has done away. It's cleansed everything. God has created this glorious new earth. Wow, the skies are more blue. 
The water is pure and crystal. The greens are greener. The flowers are more brilliant. Can you ever just close your eyes and think about what the new earth looks like? I can because the right side of my brain is a little bigger than the left side. That's the creative side. <clears throat> and my wife will even tell you this when we're building the house. She says, just don't be so creative. And I said, okay. So we try to find a balance. But I can close my eyes sometimes and think, that is beautiful, Lord. And that's the little picture that God gives me. He gives you that picture personally for what you can see. And I know you see it because you're here night after night. You're seeking for Bible truth. You're seeking for a closer relationship with Jesus Christ. And he has prepared a place for you. It's a beautiful place, friends. I cannot wait. Events at the end of the millennium. <clears throat> Christ, saints, and the city descends. Wicked dead are raised. Satan and loosed for a while. Last judgment. Satan and sinners are destroyed. Earth is cleansed and renewed. <coughs> Would you like to live in that new earth, friends? Raise your hand tonight if that's your desire. <coughs> it's a land where there's no more worry. It's a perfect place <coughs> for you and I to be a part of. You know, we live in a place. Well, before I read, let me go on. Let me just read this verse first. Nevertheless, <clears throat> we, according to his promise, look for the new heaven and the new earth, which where the righteous will dwell. And God gives us that invitation tonight to be a part of this dwelling place, this new heaven, this new earth. He desires so much. And if anyone would just reach out and, and put their arms around him, he's willing to save them, friends. You know, as I was thinking about A song tonight. One came to, to mind that I think was very fitting for this presentation because I'm thinking a thousand years. What kind of song could you sing that sort of goes along with that? But just allow me just for a second take a drink. The, um, <clears throat> when I looked at this, this subject tonight, <clears throat> I looked at it in the perspective of Christians don't belong here. We don't belong here. Our heaven and our life is beyond this world, but we have to be here for a while, right? <clears throat> but we're, we're seeking a better place. And I don't know if you're familiar with this song. It's one I, I've not probably sang this song for maybe 10 years, but I dug it out in the bottom of the guitar case, and it's called I Don't Belong. <laughs> But listen to the words, friends, <clears throat> because we don't belong. We're longing for something better. <clears throat> it's not home where men sell their souls and the taste of power is sweet. Wrong is right, neighbors fight. While the hungry are dying in the street Where kids are abused and people are used And the weak are crushed by the strong Nations gone mad and Jesus is sad I don't belong, I don't belong and I'm going someday home to my heart can be. I don't belong. And it seems like I hear the sound of a welcome home band. I don't belong. I'm a foreigner here just singing a sojourner song. I'll always know this place ain't home, and I don't belong. <clears throat> don't belong. But while I am here, I believe in like there's nothing to lose. And 
while I'll grieve, I'll just believe that my Lord is going to see me through. I'll not be deceived by earth's make-believe. Now I'll close my ears to her silent song. By, by praising his name, I'm not ashamed, because I don't belong. I don't belong, and I'm going someday home to my own native land. I don't belong, and it seems like I hear the sound of a welcome home band. I don't belong, I'm a foreigner here, just singing a sojourner's song. I'll always know this place ain't home, and I don't belong. Our Father in heaven, <clears throat> we're here for a time, but Lord, in our hearts, we know we don't belong here because we belong with you for eternity. But until then, oh Lord, create in us that new heart, that clean heart. May that heart that you give us flow over into our life and everyone around us, and may they desire to find you. Because Father, when the city comes down, and, oh, Lord, what a sad day it'll be when we look across the panoramic view through that glass city wall and maybe see someone there that we may have had an opportunity to witness to. Lord, today, may we not hold back. Father, if there's a friend, a neighbor, a sister, a brother, a spouse, whoever it is, I pray for them tonight that each one of us Lord, if, if, if you've been calling our hearts to ask someone, bring them to the meeting tomorrow night, that they may know Jesus, that they may have a closer walk with him. Each night these meetings are about you. Father, you have a specific <clears throat> plan. You have a, a road map to the end here. We see that very clearly. But most importantly, it's our walk with you. So, Lord, may our light be one that shines in a community of darkness that others may see Jesus in us. For he asks these things in Jesus' name. Amen.